Happy Search Briefing. Good morning to everyone joining us today. My name is Happy and I'll be hosting and moderating today's research briefing. So Facts First PH was an initiative that was launched early this year, January. Um, and we, we launched this initiative alongside over 100 media groups and civil society groups. The aim of Facts First PH is really to bring about a safer and healthier public space online. So we are live right now on Rappler's uh, Facebook page, Move PH, and Newsbreak as well. So for those of us who are watching live on our platforms, hello and welcome. So Facts First PH, like what I mentioned, uh, we have different groups involved here. We have fact checkers, media, we have a research layer, and we also have a legal layer. And today we put a spotlight on our research layer. This means that um, researchers and academics are able to um, look at the data generated by Facts First PH initiative and be able to bring about some insight for us to really understand how disinformation narratives and networks work. So... That is really what we will be talking about today. Um, with me right now are the two authors of the work entitled Scaffolding Our Notions of Trust. So the two authors with me today. Um, first is Professor Cheryl Ruth Soriano. She is a professor at the Department of Communication at De La Salle University, Manila, and is a research fellow at the La Salle Institute of Governance. She researches digital cultures, digital politics, and platform labor. So welcome, Professor Cheryl. Joining us today as well is Professor Edson Tandok Jr., who is an associate professor at the Wee Kim Wee School of Communication and Information at the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. His research focuses on the intersections of journalism and new technology. So welcome, Professor Cheryl and Professor Edson. Good morning. Thanks, Rappler. Uh, good morning. Hello. All right. So today you will be conducting the first ever um, research briefing. So, you know, this is for us to really gain a better understanding on what's happening online right now, because especially now as we approach elections, there's many things going on. And I think um, your research will really help us to understand. So go ahead. All right. Thank you. Uh, again, good morning to everyone and thank you to Rappler and also our Facts First partners. Um, again, along with me is Professor Edson Tendok of NTU. Um, I'd like uh, just a little bit of time to share our slides. Oops, sorry. All right, so I hope you could all see it. Um, so, so just a, a bit of introduction. Um, this paper, um, which we wrote for uh, Rappler, I think it's going to be released um, in a, just, just a little bit, focuses on what shapes our notion of trust in information and media. Um, although it is foregrounded by a study that Dr. Tandok and myself have, uh, have done together that specifically focuses on news authentication and information socialization amongst young people in the Philippines, uh, I, this is more of a reflection piece that also draws from the separate researches that we have done. No? Dr. Tandok has conducted uh, 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 a classic work on defining fake news. Uh, together with other colleagues, he also conducted research on harassment amongst women journalists. Uh, at the same time, I also conducted with other researchers um, networks of disinformation on YouTube. So we kind of draw these um, insights from these to, uh, work that we did together and also separately in this piece. And just the second point is that while insights draw from our study uh, that focuses on the youth as the, as the scope of the research, um, I guess we would like to invite you to reflect on how the same insights might perhaps resonate with other each groups. So I guess we'll begin. In this piece, we explore the factors that shape the Filipinos' trust in both information and information sources, along with their potential implications. This is particularly important in the context of an upcoming national election. We ask, what information and information sources do we trust, and why do we trust them? And importantly, how does this notion of trust shape our views about reality, about the candidates, about our vision for the country? 
In 2019 to 2020, just before the onset of the lockdowns, we conducted multiple diet and group interviews with school-going and out-of-school youth in Manila and Davao. This is to better understand um, young agents of information socialization. In short, when we talk about what information we trust, what are the influencers of this notion of trust? So family, school, friends, and also technologically mediated agents. In short, we asked the youth the question, how do you know what you think you know? This piece builds on the view shared by the youth, but also juxtaposes those with insights from, again, our past research. Our interviews found that most young people generally have significant trust in themselves, in that they see themselves as able to differentiate real from false by actively looking for evidence. And when we asked them, how do you identify what evidence to trust, they shared that they check the source of the evidence, which aligns with much of the media and information literacy toolkits no? that's, that's available to us. But what do they count as evidence that they can trust? And what factors influence this trust? The question of what factors shape, how people filter, what information they need and not need, what information they trust and do not trust, and how they think about acting on the information that they encounter is shaped by many different factors. So first, um, news and information consumption habits in the family featured prominently in the data as a contributor to the youth's notion of trustworthy information and source, particularly when it pertains to political information. So from childhood, the youth shared that they would be exposed to channels and programs that their parents preferred to watch on television or absorb discussions, maybe while eating dinner, on which news anchors, politicians, or sources of information their parents, brothers, sisters are trusted, and thus shaping their trust in return. But as they grew older, the social context that influenced their notion of informational and news trust also expanded and became much more dynamic. In this expanded social context, education plays an important role, and the class and geographic differences in the quality of education appears to emerge as a concern. Some of the respondents form good habits early on when they, their elementary school teachers incorporate reading, critical thinking, and appreciation of opinion diversity into lessons. On the other hand, others seem to have done it in much more limited ways. We think this preps some of the youth to crave more and diverse sources of information to use them to validate than other youth. The role of the family also remains important as well as expanded peer networks or friends because the youth look to them in affirming or validating the information and informational sources that they bump into. As they continually grow, the media and information landscape becomes an emerging factor. The fact that someone who has gained celebrity or influence is believed to be trustworthy by some of the youth we talk to is striking. This insight alludes to Anna Portiera's notion of entertainment publics, where entertainment cultures that we have been immersed in while watching maybe Provinciano or whatever, EBS, EBN, GMA7, these um, play an important role in the formation of publics and political publics at that and where comedic, melodramatic, and celebrity cultures generate ways of seeing and believing the information that people encounter. The immediate and visibilized quantification of influence that turns any social media producer into a celebrity can contribute to this. The varying characteristics of social media platforms also shape people's inclination to trust the information that they get from them. So for example, it was striking how across interviews, YouTube and Facebook Live, so the live format, is taken as a source of legitimacy in terms of their capacity to make information relatable and most importantly, immediate. They are perceived trustworthy because they present real and quote-unquote unadulterated information that is rendered as it happens. Explainer videos in social media are also perceived trustworthy. The affordance of a video as an explainer of information from ordinary people who emerge with a podium of epistemic authority by conducting their own research, natagpuan ko, no? sa, sa pamamagitan ng sarili kong research, validated and made believable by the quantification of support and expressing this fact-finding in a more authentic and relatable format facilitates trustworthiness. 
whether or not they share factual information. Sometimes explainers are rendered in reaction video formats that pinpoint what is deemed problematic exactly, clip by clip, about a particular issue or statement with ample inserts of mockery or canned laughter. Studies have found that videos increase perceived reality. Seeing people talk and move on screen makes viewers feel that they are being what they are seeing is real more than text-based messages. They may explain preference for and trust for influencers and micro-celebrities churning out videos on social media. They are perceived as real and ergo, their messages are trusted to be authentic. At play here is perceived synchronicity as well, yung kasabayan. Even if one is watching recorded videos and not live streams, viewers can feel as if they, what they are seeing is happening in real time. Parang kasabay. While they, this improves viewer experience, it can also make them susceptible to inaccurate information. The set of people authorized to speak and be heard, previously an exclusive circle, has expanded in the social media environment where everyone can become a publisher. In this sense, many more categories of people are able to acquire what we call epistemic authority or who are afforded the authority to speak and be heard as a source of information and knowledge. Maybe in layman's term, sino may karapatang magsalita, marinig, at magpaliwanag. Some of this new authority is warranted. In fact, it's important. A long overdue remedy to structural epistemic injustice as the breakdown of the traditional gatekeeping model may enable previously excluded or unheard voices to acquire credibility. Highly gated information environments where there's limited coverage of sources may leave out facts, but at the same time, including more perspectives can broaden no, our understanding of issues. But the participatory media environment's broadening of epistemic authority can also be hijacked and manipulated by forces seeking to advance a political agenda. Micro celebrities can sprout freely on social media, leveraging participatory cultures and the capacity to gain eyeballs and monetary returns. Indeed, in our past research, including ours, no, but many other researchers have done this too, on historical distortion, for example, on social media, micro celebrities would attempt to show that they are one with the ordinary people in finding out the truth about politics and history. And thanks to social media, these truths have the chance to see the light of day. On the other hand, they feature their mundane, daily musings in ways familiar and relatable to an ordinary person. On the other hand, these images, often planned and also scripted, also help build perceived authenticity. This manufactured authenticity helps build credibility without the responsibility and accountability that professionally trained journalists or information providers have. As argued in some of their earlier research, the intersection of political partisanship and micro-celebrity is also further reinforced by the platform's affordances, and particularly the role of algorithmic recommendation systems to create networks of self-reinforcing videos and micro-celebrities that weave a blanket of trust and truth towards the content, regardless of whether, oh, regardless of its veracity. It is true that it is up to the user how one would respond to the recommendation, but platforms can play a role of agent that limits what kind of sources and information one sees, depending on what one has previously liked, viewed, or shared, or is likely to continually share and like. In short, the platform's features play an important role too. When friends and family members emerge with contrasting viewpoints, kung sa loob ng pamilya hindi na kayo nag agree agree some people can find comfort in these filter bubbles formed by these um, algorithmic recommendation systems to affirm and corroborate their beliefs. This um, democratization of creative production on social media creates an enormous amount of content, in some ways producing good. There are more voices, more creators are able to be recognized and even earn. But also, it blurs responsibility and accountability. 
Social media platforms create an environment where there is encouragement for continuous content creation, engagement, and circulation that feed the platform's business models, but with limited and loose mechanisms for the complex ways information and authority can be manipulated. And yet, even the staunch critics of platforms are wary of regulation because more regulation can imply giving more unbridled power to platforms or governments. Some sectors instead call for greater responsibility of users, but are unable to pin down exactly how to make the other party, the platforms and content creators, or their political backers accountable and responsible. I will now turn you over to Dr. Andok Tandok to continue our discussion. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Cheryl. Uh, so yeah, let me continue. So in this environment you know, that uh, Cheryl has already discussed earlier, uh, micro celebrities, as what we're seeing, they're taking the role of uh, broadcasters, even uh, uh, performing uh, what others might interpret as journalistic acts, right? With thousands, sometimes even millions of subscribers uh, to their content, confidently doing YouTube or Facebook lives, like news correspondents or uh, interviewing political personalities with frames that uh, may be slanted to support a particular political agenda. A mimicry of the news genre um, is a feature uh, that allows them to build epistemic authority. And it's also a style that we find um, in other countries, uh, say in Brazil, in Russia, and Ukraine. So doubt and gossip seeding is another uh, strategy. Um, this is a creative one because while publicly articulated, it is coded and equivocal. Thus, uh, they allow uh, the, the interlocutor or the one expressing the message to elude uh, responsibility. Some micro celebrities do not directly say things. Instead, they make one doubt, uh, punctuating their headline accusations with question marks. It prods viewers to do further fact finding, but of course leads them to other videos and content that further fan the doubt. So one thing that we um, also observe is that you know these micro celebrities also tend to be network. Um, so they, while they might be posting their their own separate uh, videos, right, uh, the, the video recommendations of course would go to other uh, like minded um, other like minded celebrities. And so even if you go and and say, uh, try to seek other perspectives, the perspectives that you may end up finding uh, will be consistent with what you have just watched. In the worst cases, there are videos amplifying doubt and even harassment highlighting specific media targets, which then facilitates a moral justification for harassment and signals a template for how network audiences should interact with the target. Both micro celebrities and social media platforms assume the role of uh, public utilities, but without the applicability of broadcasting ethics and codes, their gatekeeping and influence functions remain largely outside the purview of critical interrogation. They freely circulate with partisan epistemic communities while evading scrutiny and accountability. Of course, there are expressions that are blatantly hateful and libelous and can be legally called out. And some of the tech platforms have uh, called these out and, and deleted some accounts and some content. But many creative expressions of hate and disinformation remain in the gray area of regulation because they can hide under the banner of just expressing my views or the very infamous respect my opinion. Uh, so sometimes they also do not strictly fall within the platform's standards for strikes uh, or takedowns, even if others flag them. Uh, the platforms would say that uh, these do not uh, violate uh, the particular standards of the platform. Um, so they also uh, uh, create, uh, micro celebrities also create an image of credibility for the quote unquote fact finding uh, activity that they do, not only by emphasizing that the videos are a product of careful, they would say they've conducted in the in depth research, but also by casting doubt and hostility toward traditional information gatekeepers and particularly professional journalists. These traditional gatekeepers are to some extent even demonized for being selective in the information they present to the public or are accused of blatantly hiding the truth. What we're arguing, uh, and this is that 
this hostility toward traditional holders of epistemic authority, including journalists, is part of a wave of what um, some communication and media scholars call as anti-media populism. Anti-media populism discourses across the globe are increasingly uh, being shared and amplified on social media using the same schema of elite versus the people that stems from decades of exclusion. This discursive condemnation of political correctness and epistemic superiority of often middle-class educated cultural elites that sideline ordinary people's views also corresponds to a hostility toward them in this contemporary media environment. So one scholar, for example, wrote that the technological performance of populism, uh, referring to that uh, concept, this implies that not only the kind of not only the kind of claims making that speaks for the interests of the people, but also by speaking as the people, you know, using uh, raw language, you know, ordinary uh, day to day uh, linguistic styles. In doing so, micro celebrities serve or project themselves as serving as spokespersons of the critique of established structures and values of dominant culture through amateurism and manufactured authenticity. In this way, they are able to construct and legitimize their epistemic authority. So um, one thing that we we've, we've also um, written uh, in the report, which we hope to share with you soon. Um, is that you know, we, we feel that we need, um, uh, give me a moment, yeah, so, okay, I'm, I lost it, okay, so there's one thing that we wrote in, 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 um, in the report that we, we need to examine, you know, if, if these opening of spaces uh, for democratic conquest, uh, that seems uh, to be uh, what uh, this micro celebrities um, are, are projecting to be happening, right? Whether this opening of spaces truly makes way for marginalized views, or if it is used merely as a pulpit um, for opinion manipulation, another mechanism to manipulate um, and and influence public opinion um, to appropriate greater power to political personalities. So, in their quest to promote virtues of democratic voice, micro celebrity politics, and their excesses need to be scrutinized by unmasking their embeddedness in political structures and operations. Okay. Give me a moment. So another thing um, that we wrote in the report, um, it, it's so we 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 in, in in the past, you know, when when digitization was new, uh, social media platforms were new. Um, uh, uh, some studies were saying that you know, these are opening um, uh, are giving platforms, you know, to marginalized voices, and that they would demo democratize uh, the internet. And what we're seeing now is is. Uh, that the specific that specific me mechanism can be exploited. So in the report, we also wrote that the extent to which micro celebrities in their critique of the media status quo are challenging how things are and replacing them with better alternatives should also be scrutinized as uh, these uh, individuals amass clicks and eyeballs and pocket digital advertising revenues as well as payments for personal endorsements, they are no longer just questioning established structures, they are embedding themselves into the new status quo while effectively evading questions of responsibility, ethics, financial transparency, and bias by loudly asking the same questions from the mainstream media and other targets that they are demonizing. So in, in doing so, they are rallying the public into a bandwagon of hate, as we call it, targeted at legitimate journalists, for example. Um, and and, and, and while, while they do that, they are uh, successfully deflecting scrutiny away from their own sometimes, uh, if not often, questionable practices. As another scholar reflected in, in uh, uh, one remark, what emerges uh, is an epistemic structure facilitated by the manipulation of trust under the illusion of quote unquote, discovering for oneself. Micro celebrities can claim that they have discovered certain truths hidden from the public, even when these proclamations of self-discovery can be a product of disinformation architectures or a politically motivated agenda. In turn, subscribers and followers uh, will, might end up thinking that they have discovered for themselves too. 
So as media educators and uh, communication researchers, we think this poses a distinctive and possibly dangerous threat that implies the need for a collective introspection because of its potential longer term implications to our democracy. What can happen is the curation of epistemic communities that are resistant to alternative evidence or hostile to other sources of information or multiple perspectives. And this is why when uh, we started with questions about the processes by which epistemic trust and authority are shaped, the young people that we interviewed, and we guess uh, also with uh, true with many other Filipino publics of different age groups, uh, would believe that they they do assess uh, the information that they encounter and they are to a good extent selective of the sources of information they trust uh, if you ask them do you how sure do you, do you, are you sure or, or do you know how to uh, verify information they would say that they they get information from multiple sources but what are these sources how are these uh, different information sources connected so this implies that the the question should shift from did you check the source of the information? Because if you ask them, they would say they check the source of information. And that question should now shift to why and how have you come to trust that source of information and distrust others? It requires a radical questioning of our epistemic past and present amid this very dynamic digital environment and expanding social networks that we're in, where trust can be both reinforced and also manipulated. That ends our, our, our sharing, and uh, I think we're happy to discuss. Are there any uh, comments? All right. Thank you very much, um, Prof. Cheryl and Prof. Um, Edson. So I'll, I'll start with my question. Um, this was, uh, Cheryl, you mentioned something about the need to hold these micro-celebrities or influencers accountable or responsible to the information that they put out. So, for example, journalists, um, when journalists publish something or when media outfits publish something, there's always a byline, there's always ethics surrounding that. So, do you know of any best practices for how we can do this? How can we hold these micro celebrities or influencers accountable and, and make them responsible to the kind of information that they put out? Thanks, Happy. And I invite Edson as well to add on if um, he has anything, um, any further insights. No? To, um, what, what we're saying is that, and, and this is not um, just us, so, so we see the micro-celebrities doing this as we described, um, and we point out the importance of doing further investigative research because not all micro-celebrities are perhaps politically motivated, no? and there's a lot of things we can learn from micro-celebrities, but it is possible that some of the micro-celebrities if we follow them and do deep investigative research, I believe Dr. Ong is, has, has also mentioned this in, in one of the interviews, to see how these micro-celebrity performances are embedded within larger you know, political operations in disinformation architectures. And I guess the data that's available in, in, in facts first and, and within the community of researchers connecting micro-celebrity networks with fact-checked disinformation uh, being able to map these uh, interlocutors with um, uh, uh, the statements that they make and identifying these uh, will, will allow us to kind of investigate this, the, the, these networks more broadly and then follow the trail and understand no, who are politically uh, uh, backing or the, the political operators behind them. Uh, again, with a caveat that um, it, it's, uh, it's an important space still. It's a, an important democratizing space, but we need to identify those no, that are uh, seeding political agenda through the face of the ordinary. Maybe yeah, Edson. It's 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 an important but also a difficult question um, because when you when you well well Happy was asking her question um, I thought maybe we can look at how 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 journalists are embedded within um, a context where there is uh, different mechanisms of accountability right um, we're embedded in most most journalists are embedded into organizations and within an organization there are. Um, certain uh, regulations. Um, there's also like professional organizations um, that can uh, uh, engage in, in, in self-regulation within certain professions, but um, we cannot apply uh, these uh, systems uh, 
to micro celebrities because they they while they op well some of them operate uh, in groups right that they're networked um, and then there might be some pre planning involved I think most micro celebrities may be operating um, as individuals and of course it's 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 their right um, it's it's part of their um, uh, uh, right to free expression to use the the, the platforms um, but again yeah free expression uh, will should always come with with responsibility so. I think a way to approach this while we're still figuring out if are there if there are any formal mechanisms is to really to to um, train uh, the, the the viewers of, of these uh, micro celebrities to have some certain expectations of how these micro celebrities should behave. You know the the kind of standards that we apply for journalists when we expect journalists to behave in a certain way. How come we're not applying the same standards when we are watching uh, micro celebrities who are performing or trying to perform acts of journalism. So why are there differences in standards? In the end, the accountability um, is, is something that, that uh, uh, viewers um, should demand uh, across different information sources. Right, so would it be possible, for example, like if you unfollow them, that is also an act of, of holding them accountable? Is, can that be? Okay. <laughs> All right. So my my other question, um, Edson, you pointed out this um, the discovering for oneself. So for me, when I hear that, it it doesn't necessarily mean that that's something bad. If somebody wants to do their own research, in fact, it's a good quality to have that you want to investigate and you want to research further. So my question is, what are the barriers then, or what are the things that lead them to this information? And the follow up question to that: How do you lead them to a path um, wherein they are confronted with verified information and facts. Yeah, I'll answer the first part of the, the question because it's easier. The second part, a child can answer, but I think it's more difficult. <laughs> so um, uh, I think that, um, so about the question of, of course, um, when you when we when we talk to uh, uh, these young people, and even when we talk to, to um, other people, they would always say there's there's some uh, some level of confidence that they know how to how to verify information but the, the important question is how are they verifying information there are um, studies um, uh, done in other countries um, ex online experiments where they they found that um, individuals are more likely to verify information that is consistent with their prior beliefs um, Meaning, uh, we, I mean, ideally, we think that if people are unsure, then that's when they verify information. But others are finding that when people want something to be true, meaning they already believe in it, um, they, that's when they verify, that's when they seek uh, information to reinforce what they're already believing in. And this is consistent with the work on, on selective exposure, that we selectively expose ourselves to information sources that uh, echo uh, what we uh, already believe in. So, so, and that's human nature. It's, it's, um, and I think it also comes from uh, where we prioritize not, not what we prioritize is not having correct information, but knowing that we are correct. So, meaning sometimes when even when we have when we have wrong information, uh, we still want to be correct, and so we try to to find uh, evidence that might confirm uh, what we believe in, and that leads us to select um, certain sources of information that may be questionable. So, how do we address that? I think one way. Before I turn over to Cheryl, one way is it's really to nudge people to go beyond uh, um, uh, what I mean. It's it's human nature for us to to find uh, uh, information that will support our beliefs. I think at least that's just easier cognitively. But, but I think it's important to nudge people to go beyond that, to, to build this habit of, of seeking multiple perspectives, going beyond um, what uh, we already believe in. Well, Edson addressed that question so well. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just add a few bits that when we were thinking of the title for this piece and also discussing between myself and Edson, uh, that uh, quote about the illusion of discovering for oneself or discovering for oneself is a, is a central bit of the piece. And because, um, it, 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 and I totally agree with you, Happy, no? That's, it's an important feeling when you have discovered for oneself. I guess the question we're posing is when we feel that we know, when we feel that we have discovered, um, 
perhaps we need to ask more deeply and further what led us to that feeling that we have indeed discovered. Because fundamentally, no, and that's why we titled it scaffolding, our notions of trust. Because what we encounter as information and information sources and how we rely on those evidence and weed out others no, has broader implications on trust in the broader democratic system. How we trust people, how we trust media personalities, how we trust leaders and candidates. And so I guess that at the core of the piece, we are kind of uh, nudging a reflection to shift the terms of the conversation to always prod us to ask, why do we trust this? And why do we distrust these other sectors? And what have what led us to come to that conclusion? Right. Um, from, from your presentation, Edson, something struck me also about how when we opened up this space and it was democratized, um, an, an important question to ask was, did it really enable more marginalized voices? So yes, we have more voices, but does this really capture you know, people who, who don't have a voice in, in real life? So my question is, how can we use this space and maybe some insights from your research as well? How can we use... Um, the space to enable more marginalized voices. Yeah, I think yeah, when, when internet was new and social media was new, uh, to some extent it did open uh, the space for um, voices that were um, uh, ignored by, by the mainstream, at least by mainstream media. Um, but but soon, sooner rather than later, we saw that um, even these spaces um, represented certain barriers and also privileged um, certain actors with um, uh, resources, right? Um, uh, so, so even I mean, we're looking at um, the use of, of um, social media, uh, we've seen how uh, over time, even like uh, celebrities, you know, were, were posting their videos and were raking in uh, digital revenues. Um, and, and in the past, you know, it was easy to, we had some uh, breakout stars on YouTube, for example, coming, just uploading random videos, right, and suddenly they're, they're uh, garnering a, a mass audience. But now if we look at, you know, videos that are trending, most of the time it's, it's, um, it's uh, people who've uh, already had uh, resources um, and following from another platform, another mainstream platform um, successfully crossing over and crowding this space. So even in terms of entertainment, we see, we see that happening. Um, uh, in the Philippines, we still have, and in many other countries, we still have barriers to say access, um, and even uh, uh, technological um, uh, skills, right? So these still represent barriers um, that uh, allow certain actors, certain people to uh, um, have their voices uh, be represented more, louder uh, on these spaces than, than others. Um, so yeah, so I think that that's, that's an observation. How, what can we do uh, to, to improve this? Um, again, yeah, and it's, it's a difficult question. Um, part, we, we, we can in, uh, train uh, people to be more discerning, uh, equip people with more skills, but in the end, you know, it's still about uh, now that, that the, the scaffolding, you know, the, the social media space is already there, um, it's easier for people with more resources to build on what's already there. Yeah, so I don't know, Cheryl. Right, Cheryl, would you like to add something? Yeah, I, I guess beyond uh, creating or carving more spaces for individual voices, perhaps we need more spaces for dialogue and exchange that people can jump into, that people can participate in meaningfully. And I guess the second layer um, uh, 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 that I will respond to your question is that on social media, many people have found the opportunity to speak up. I totally agree with Edson that there's still that she, uh, that technological uh, divide in, in, in large ways, but some of the uh, technological promotions have, have also um, uh, allowed some people to get gain access. But who gained traction is the question. Right? The, functional, the functional divide is the question. Who gained traction? Who has the, capac the capacity to get your boom microphones and then uh, get, get uh, uh, scripts polished well and then gain a lot of traction? And that's why we zoom into the question of micro-celebrities. And so foregrounded with that attention towards micro-celebrities and the subscriberships and the followers that they do is to ask the question, who do they truly speak for? 
Right. Yeah. Very, very important to to <laughs> to ask that constantly. Like, who is um, who who are they speaking for? Who are they really representing? Um, I, I'd like to. We have a question here that is from one of our participants. This is from Juan Gabriel Felix. Um, so he will ask the question directly. Go ahead, Juan. Hello. Hello. Uh, good, morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Really, really interesting. I'm really excited to read the the actual content. Um. So for my question, uh, I I I said that um, granted that one of the direct solutions is as Dr. Ong and company recommended, uh, the disclosure of campaign funds, no, to expose micro celebrities working with candidates and you and disinformation networks. Uh, but this is more of a legal route, and I'm from um Dakila, kasi, and our our angle is more toward artists and content creators. So my question is, um, is there a role that artists and other content creators can play to leverage the findings from your study? Do you, do you want okay. to begin, Edson? Or... Hey, so I teach communication and we have a segment in our program that is communication arts. And in communication arts, we train, we hopefully, we train um, our, our young people to be able to communicate and express their views creatively. And that's practically our vision is that when they graduate, they will become like you, the people of Dakila. So I think in this entire conversation, artists have an important role to play because the capacity of artistic expression to tug into the emotions um, and emotions connecting to our understanding, but also attachment towards issues that matter, towards realities that matter to us, right, will we'll play an important role in, in, in this entire conversation. So beyond making accessible information that are difficult, but also evidence-based, which is very common amongst professors that are not very well-versed in, you know, in laymanizing their research or output, historians as well. But there, there's good effort now being done now. So artists can come in, not only in making these palatable and understandable, but making them emotionally con con relatable and, 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 and connective to, to, the, to the viewers. Maybe Dr. Tandok has more uh, insights. Thanks, thanks, uh, Juan Gabriel. Um, so yeah, so I mean, first uh, going back with the, I mean, I agree that the uh, getting the the campaign campaign funding declarations right uh, would definitely be helpful um, and be will be part of that mechanism of accountability. But that's more, uh, at least within the current legal frameworks, it's more uh, for uh, the candidates to do right rather than the micro celebrities to individually uh, declare. Um, in terms of the role of, of artists, I think yeah, artists play an, an important role as to what um, uh, Cheryl had already said, um, especially at a time when we know that for young, young people, uh, at not only in the Philippines, but in many other markets, um, not, young people do not uh, read the news routinely, right? They're not drawn to the news all the time. Um, and so I, mean, I think artists can, can help uh, find ways in how do we um, make young people be uh, interested um, in the news. Like they recognize that news is important, but uh, they also find news boring or sometimes not very relevant. So I think artists have a, a role to play here. And I think this also uh, is linked to uh, what we were discussing earlier about uh, marginalized voices. So uh, marginalized voice is not is not only about what voices are represented um, in, in these spaces, but also what voices actually ultimately reach uh, the public, right? And when we focus on voices reaching the public, um, some uh, members of, of, of our communities may, may not be hearing the, the voices that they should be hearing. And part of that is, is maybe access. There are barriers to access in terms of what they can, um, what reaches them. But also part of that is maybe comprehension or appreciation of information. I think artists can play a role here in making uh, important information be more accessible, be more comprehensible, um, especially to those who need them the most. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, your answer actually reminded me, you know, like th there's an entire generation that that grew up not reading newspapers. Like when I was younger, you know, like I knew what was news because I read it in the newspaper. I watched it on a new show. Now it's it's all together in, in one platform. So um, I'd like to call on Raptors Tech Editor Jello Gonzalez for his question. Go ahead, Jello. Hey, guys. Um, 
from from the social media platforms you have like uh, you know like a wish list from them as to address addressing this uh, rise of um illicit micro celebrities and influencers and do you make a differentiation between micro celebrities and influencers or are they interchangeable <clears throat> Do you want me to address first, Edson? So, yeah. So in, in the literature, sometimes they, they use um, micro-influencers or micro-celebrities. These are mm-hmm. your non-traditional celebrities that have managed to amass um, a significant following in social media. Um, of course, the yeah, uh, different writers um, use them interchangeably, but I think we're, uh, we're understanding what we're talking about here. Um, so hindi sila, of course, some of your traditional celebrities are also on social media but what we're talking about here are those that have found their uh, uh, um, celebrity hood no? via social media mm-hmm. um, uh, Ed- Edson you might want to continue uh, there, there's the first part of the question um, sorry. That social media wish list yes. right? what we hope yes. social media can do um, well, one thing that I've been, um, okay, not directly related to micro celebrities first, but, but my wish list is um, how, whether platforms can, can encourage or maybe even incentivize um, uh, corrective behavior, meaning um, that, that people will be more encouraged to, to say something if they see something that's false, right? Um, currently, there, I mean, for, uh, so, some social media platforms have mechanisms um, that allow users to flag content that they think um, is, is not accurate or is false um, or as a form of fake news. Um, but there's really no, no um, encouragement or incentive uh, for us to do that. Um, and especially in, in communities where um, it's considered um, impolite, you know, to correct people who are old, older than you are, um, how, do we, how do we normalize this behavior? That it's okay, you know, that it's, it's okay to be called out uh, for, for sharing something that's wrong. And we actually should encourage that behavior so we don't become complicit in, in this, the propagation of, of falsehood. So that's, that's one. Um, in terms of micro-celebrities, um, what would be my wish list, you know, uh, in, terms, in, in terms of... I don't know, I've not thought about this. I mean, I've, I've been thinking about what, what social media platforms can do to combat misinformation. And we know that they've not been doing enough. And when they started to do something, it, it was already several years too late. Um, I think it's, it's probably the same thing with, with micro celebrities. And how do we make them regulate something that's bringing them the, the clicks and the eyeballs and the attention um, mm. that, that they want? I think that's, that's tough. I, if, I, if I come up with something, I'll let you know, general. Yeah. All right. Uh, there, there, there were some efforts of some social media companies like um, Google, for example, for YouTube to provide contextualized information, I guess, as a response to some reports about disinformation in the platform. So, for example, they have provided, um, well, uh, interestingly, Britannica information uh, or some other information in relation to martial law. So when you are uh, 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 searching for information on YouTube about this, um, you will have um, a kind of a banner on where you are supposed to be able to find some information that you could trust. Um, perhaps mm-hmm. that is useful, um, but, but, but there's also a breadth of other important or relevant sources of information that, that's, of course, not covered there. And um, it, uh, and, and, but I guess the, the, the more deep um, question is the power of micro-celebrity networks. No? And Edson alluded to this earlier. There are individual micro-celebrities, but the power that could be wielded by that network of influence is something that we think. No? And how that connects to shaping notions of epistemic authority is something that platforms need to confront. Complex kasi yun eh. Hindi siya ganun kadali. Because you can put down one video, but you're talking about networks of influence that are doubt seeding, not exactly uh, fo- kind of falling within a gray area. So merong, merong community standards and platforms, but some of them go into the gray area, but because yes. they function as a network, they're able to wield powerful influence in their audiences. So what we're saying is that platforms need to confront this problematic and attend to this within their content moderation mechanisms or, or, or regulatory discussions. I mean, I, I thought of something very quickly, Happy. So yeah, I think 
platforms can also do better in, in um, allowing, if not um, normalizing, cross-cutting exposure, as they call it in research, so that we're not only seeing what we want to see um, when we, when we uh, consume um, information or, or get information from uh, a traditional um, news media, for example, we are exposed to a, a diverse perspectives. You know, um, a journalist would interview several people and then put all those uh, perspectives together in a report. But if you're only watching um, a video from one uh, micro celebrity, you're only getting one perspective. And uh, as what Cheryl said, then if you watch other videos, um, that are related to this video, you're all only seeing a single perspective. So I think if platforms can um, encourage uh, or, or, or foster cross-cutting exposure, I think that will help. And studies have found that cross-cutting exposure um, leads to certain uh, political socialization outcomes. All right, thank you. And I know we have time for just one more question. Um, we have a question from one of our Rappler Plus members, Gabriel Miller. Gabriel, go ahead. Hi, sorry, I, I didn't even realize that uh, was there. I have a quick question. And I want to talk about what was referenced earlier in terms of where uh, absorbing the news comes from. And if there's a place for school, it, is it proper at this point for schools to begin to address the question of where students are getting their news from? Or would that be viewed as an improper intrusion into the private lives of families and everything else? Because it still seems to me like you have to stop, start there, maybe. So many young people that I know now get their news exclusively from Facebook, which often means that they get only rumor. Thank you. And thank you, Happy. Thank you, Gabe. Um, go ahead, Cheryl. OK. Um... We mentioned schools as an important uh, node within this these agents of socialization, right? Because well, as as, kids, as as young people grow up, uh, um, this is fundamental from primary school. But beyond um, uh, uh, specific information, you know, we 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 were thinking about instilling the notion or the questions of how do we trust information from the very beginning. Now, because, because these, these are fundamental questions that need to be kind of harnessed amongst our young people. How do we form trust? How, how, what information do you trust? Why do you trust that information? Why do you distrust other kinds of information? And continually as, as, as people grow up. But of course, again, no, even as we speak about the formal education context, we know that many social media users in the Philippines are uh, I, either out of school or already after school. And we need to also attend to those clusters and publics and ask these questions at the same time. Why do you trust and how have you come to trust this information? We feel that the, the discussions about disinformation, misinformation, media literacy should go into the core question of information trust. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, Edson, go ahead. Yeah, so thanks, uh, Gabriel. I think yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. I agree with, with Cheryl that um, what's important to instill, uh, even at a young age, is, is really the, the critical thinking process, you know, of not only of telling them you should get your news from this source, but, but why should we trust a particular source? Um, uh, but I think yeah, what's important is also to, to instill um, uh, uh, to the young people that News is important, you know, especially at a time when, when um, and a lot of news consumption uh, within uh, young for young people tend to be incidental, meaning they don't really seek out news and they come across news because they are in social media spaces. And if 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 uh, news consumption is incidental, um, the attention uh, might also be be not that that high, uh, and the appreciation of of the importance of that information um, may, might be secondary to say how, how outrageous or entertaining or funny or, or humorous a certain piece of information is. I think uh, aside from, from uh, building this uh, um, uh, notion of making sure that the process of seeking information um, uh, is, is, is a, an ideal one, I think it's also important to stress uh, that seeking information, keep staying informed of what's happening around you um, is important. 
All right. Um, thank you very much. So I think that ends our question and answer um, portion for today's briefing. We still have a few questions that were here, but we will just attend to them via email because we um, we don't have time anymore to answer them live. So thank you very much to all of you who asked questions. And thank you, of course, to Prof. Cheryl and Prof. Edson for joining us today in this uh, our first ever research briefing for the Facts First PH initiative. Thank you. Thanks as well. Thank you.